It's my great pleasure to welcome our next speaker, um, Philip Wallen. Philip recognises that we cannot achieve true equality amongst ourselves unless we learn to practise equality with all human uh, living beings. Philip started his career as a merchant banker, but not just any banker. He was made vice president of Citibank at the age of just 34. Luckily for humanity, that's not where his career stayed. Instead, Philip was thrust into advocacy when he recognised the cries of animals in slaughterhouses as the same cries we hear in human beings. It was at this point he realised in their capacity to suffer, a dog is a pig, is a bear, is a boy. The realisation of the equality of pain between humans and animals is what drive, drives Philip to promote kindness to all other living beings. Philip founded the Winsome Constance Kindness Trust, which provides support for more than 400 projects across 40 countries. His work focuses on improving the environment and helping societies most vulnerable, children, youth, animals and the terminally ill. By providing assistance to those who need it most, Philip's work levels the playing field for all living beings. And Philip, I know, would normally be here with his partner, Trix, but sadly she's in hospital at the moment, um, and we send our best wishes to her. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce Philip Wallen. Please make him welcome. This is the first time I've ever given a talk using a PowerPoint presentation. Usually Trix uh, does it for me. Uh, alas, for the last five months, she's been in the Peter McCallum Hospital. And she's, uh, she usually sits somewhere down there and clicks it for me because I just don't understand this high-tech stuff. They say that behind every successful man, there's a very surprised woman. <laughs> so you can see I, I miss her gravely. King Lear, late at night on the cliffs, asks the blind Earl of Gloucester, how do you see the world? And the blind man Gloucester replies, I see it feelingly, and shouldn't we all? Rudyard Kipling, writing of young men dying in World War I, and if they ask you why we died, tell them that our fathers lied. That legacy of lies continues today. Everything we think we know about the meat and dairy industry is a preposterous lie. You see, the world today is crying out for only two things, leadership and the truth. Today, I'm simply going to tell you the truth. The wise Chinese have a term for it, Zheng Zhao. Listen to the friend who tells you the truth, even when it hurts. So let's just tell the truth, fearlessly and forcefully. That is what the Sanskrit word Satyagraha means, the truth force. Now, Brendan Kennelly in the book of Judas wrote, if you want to serve your age, betray it. But what does that mean, to betray your age? It means expose its lies, humiliate its conceits, debunk its arrogance, and condemn them to face harsher truths. Alvin Toffler said that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Now, I have long admired Count Moltke, the great Prussian general, a soldier who preferred to think rather than to speak, a man silent in seven languages. You see, it takes courage to stand up here and speak. It also takes courage to sit down and listen. Now, there was a time when my favorite food was filet mignon and lobster a fact for which I am so profoundly ashamed today. So on my first 40th birthday, I decided to take all the money I'd ever made, houses, apartment blocks, all the money, factories, everything I'd ever made, and give it away with warm hands and die broke. And I confess, so far, we're right on budget. <laughs> so what made me decide to leave the world of lobsters and Learjets in exchange for shelters and slaughterhouses. To take nothing but pictures, own nothing but memories, leave nothing but footprints, kill nothing but time. 
you see something happened to me. I had been to Dante's Inferno, but unlike Dante Alighieri, I did not have Beatrice for my love, nor Virgil for my guide. I heard the screams of my dying father as his body was ravaged by the many cancers that killed him. And I realized I'd heard those screams before. In the slaughterhouse, on the cattle ships to the Middle East, and a dying mother whale as a harpoon explodes in her brain as she calls out to her calf. Their cries were the cries of my father. They were identical. And I discovered that when we suffer, we suffer as equals. And in their capacity to suffer, a dog is a pig, is a bear, is a boy. So when I look into your faces here today, I recall the words of the Greek poet Horace. Change only the name, and my story is also about you. So this is where I work today. In two minutes, please do not avert your gaze. Please try to watch it. In China, 7,000 magnificent moon bears, their limbs torn off in traps, are imprisoned in steel coffins welded shut as a catheter drains bile into a bucket which the Chinese drink. For 26 years, the bears go insane. In Korea, dogs are beaten to death in the marketplace. The butchers believe that fear and suffering makes the meat tasty. In South Africa, 5,000 orphan lions are drugged and killed with spears and torn apart by hunting dogs, and they call it sport. And in Canada, 300,000 baby seal pups are clubbed and skinned alive on the ice, their tiny hearts still beating. And in Australia on the right, we killed 90 million kangaroos who adorn our coat of arms, the largest land animal slaughter on the planet. And we sent millions of our animals, born on Australian soil, on death ships to the Middle East, where their eyes are stabbed out and their tendons are slashed. Every penny I invested in the Bussatine slaughterhouse was utterly wasted. And in Asia, dogs are suspended on steel hooks and skinned alive to make fur trim and coats, which are sold in Melbourne. And we treat the ocean as our private pantry and as a public toilet. The Pacific gyra now is so full of plastic, junk, and human feces, it has created a floating footprint bigger than India. There are five bags full of plastic for every foot of coastline in the world. And by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. I funded the plastic car movie and showed the Chief Justice of India in New Delhi how cows in the street often have 50 kilos of plastic, wire, and syringes in their stomachs. And his honor ruled, plastic poses a greater threat to India than nuclear war. Dolphins and whales are stabbed to death in the shallows of Japan and the Faroes Islands, huge bays are blood red. One hundred million sharks are torn from the sea, their fins are hacked off, and their bodies thrown overboard to die agonizing deaths for shark fin soup. And factory farms here in Australia spew chemicals into the ocean, creating hypoxic dead zones of one million square kilometers, killing coral, plants, and ocean animals. And so-called unviable dairy calves, who cannot be sold for veal, are killed by dairy farmers, smashing in their skulls with hammers or jumping on their rib cages and crushing their hearts. That is the law. That's how it has to be done. And billions of bouncy little chicks are ground up alive 
in mechanical mincers simply because they are male. And I've just come back from Asia and the Middle East and saw religious sacrifices of innocent animals that make the 21st century look like the new dark ages. And children starve in poor countries because their croplands now produce meat for foreigners. I won't show you any more pictures. Now in human history, only 100 billion human beings ever lived. Seven and a half billion people are alive today. And we humans torture and kill two billion sentient, living, loving animals every week. We stab and suffocate one billion ocean animals every eight hours. If human beings were killed at the same rate, we would be wiped out in one weekend. Some of you probably know of my significant involvement with Sea Shepherd. Trillions of fish are ground up into pellets to feed to livestock. Vegetarian cows are now the world's largest ocean predators. You see, the oceans are dying in our time. By 2048, all our fisheries will be dead, the lungs and the arteries of the earth. You would know that oceans sequester more CO2 than all the forests of the world put together. 10,000 entire species are wiped out every year because of the actions of one species. And we now face the sixth mass extinction in cosmological history. If any other organism did this, a biologist would call it a virus. It is a crime of unimaginable proportions. Now you would know there are two peak predators on this planet, human beings on land and orcas in the ocean. In the 20th century, human beings killed 200 million members of their own species. Orcas killed none. And don't expect any protection from your own governments either. In the 20th century, 100 million people have been killed by their own governments. Now, Victor Hugo said that there was nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. But I say there is nothing more destructive than a bad idea whose time has passed. The time for meat has passed. Happily, the world is changing. 20 years ago, Twitter was a bird sound. WWW was a stuck keyboard. Cloud was in the sky. Skype was a typo. 3G was a parking space. Google was a baby's burp. And Al-Qaeda was my plumber. <laughs> now, the most beautiful word ever written in any country at any time, at, in, at any stage in human history, came from India, from the Upanishads, 3,000 years ago. Ahimsa, nonviolence to any living being. Not, it's important not because it describes our nationality, our politics, our religion, our diet, or our lifestyle, but because it describes our character. It says we reject violence in all its forms, in our streets, our homes, our thoughts, our hearts, and at our dining tables. And this is not just about animal rights. It's also about human wrongs. Animal rights is now the greatest social justice issue since the abolition of slavery. It is an, a revolutionary event more powerful than the Industrial Revolution, the Reformation, the Hubble Telescope, or anything ever conceived by Galileo, Copernicus, Einstein, Darwin, Hawking, or Freud. Because it protects the most precious of all things, life, the growing vegan movement is on the right side of history. They are creating the new enlightenment, the second renaissance. Now everyone in this room would know the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And it came, as you know, from the New Testament of the Nazarene Jew Jesus. But it actually goes back even further to the Babylonian Jew Hillel. 70 years BCE. 
In fact, it goes back even further to the Analects of Confucius, 500 years BCE. And the truth be told, it precedes the dawn of writing. It was probably enshrined in the human heart long before we thought of committing our words to, to, uh, to writing. Now, the great anthropologist Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a few committed people can change the world. Indeed, that is the only thing that ever has. Well, there are only 13 million Jews in the world, but they play such a vibrant role in international affairs. Look at the number of Nobel Prizes they win every year. Trix and I sat in the stadium during the, the Olympics full of pride as Australia won more medals than every country in the world with the exception of the United States and Russia. Tibet's population is only three million, but who hasn't heard of the plight of the Tibetan? But there are over 600 million vegetarian and vegans in the world, and that is bigger than the United States, England, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Canada, New Zealand, Israel, all put together. If they were one nation, they would be bigger than the 27 nations of the European Union. They are bigger than NATO, and they are bigger than OPEC. And despite this massive demographic footprint, they are still drowned out by the raucous hunt and shoot and kill and cartels who believe that violence is the answer when it should not even be a question. But alas, we live in a world of media sound bites and tweets. It reminds me of Hannah Arendt's book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she coins the term, the banality of evil. This is how a deceitful journalist at the Australian of the Year Awards in Canberra interviewed me and twisted my innocent words. Mr. Wallen, I'm surprised a man of your standing would say on your website that meat is murder, a little old lady with a budgerigar is offending God, Livestock production is unethical. There will be no peace until we stop killing animals. Industry is unattractive. Animals are like human children. Can't you see how offensive that is to our rural audience? Well, this was my diplomatic counterpunch. Well, you certainly bludgeon the English language to death, but if you're going to quote me, please do so honestly. I did say, a robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. But that came from William Blake in Auguries of Innocence. And by the way, it was Prof Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who said, a sparrow does not fall from the sky without Allah knowing. And yes, I did say, the commandment thou shalt not kill applies to the murder of any living being. It was inscribed on the human breast long before it was proclaimed from Mount Sinai. As long as there are slaughterhouses, there will be battlefields. But that was Leo Tolstoy. And yes, I agree, I did say the roots of cruelty are not strong, just widespread. But the time will come when humanity, protected by custom, will succumb to humanity championed by thought. A man is ethical only when all life is sacred to him. But that was Albert Schweitzer, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. And yes, I did say, as long as we kill animals, there will never be peace. It's only one step to the concentration camps of Hitler and Stalin. There will be no justice as long as man stands with a knife to destroy someone who is weaker than him. But that was Isaac Singer, also a winner of the Nobel Prize. And yes, I admit, I did have something to say about animals and children. The wolf will lie down with a lamb, the leopard with the young goat, the young lion with the young ones of the herd, and a little child will lead them. But that came from the prophet Isaiah. And no, I didn't say a darn thing about greed and ambition. That wasn't me, that was Jesus. Blame him. Behold the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, King Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. And for good measure, he threw in a left hook and an uppercut. Whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So are you, as a journalist, suggesting that your rural audience is offended by Nobel Prize winners and the prophets, or should I just go home and burn my books? 
I seem to recall that was the strategy favoured by Pol Pot. Well, the journalist was speechless, and the next day he attacked me for being a radical. Ladies and gentlemen, we need another radical Copernicus or Galileo to remind us that we are not the center of the universe. Animals are not just other species. They are other nations, and we murder them at our own peril. As Paul Watson, the captain of Sea Shepherd, said, if you want to know where you would have stood on slavery during the Civil War, don't look at where you stand on slavery today. Look at where you stand on animal rights. I had the slide up of the great astrophysicist Carl Sagan's picture from the Voyager space spacecraft showing the tiniest microscopic pinhole sliver of space. And he described planet Earth as our beautiful home, our pale blue dot suspended on a sunbeam. Now, human beings comprise 30% of the mass of all land animals. Slaughter farm animals are 66%, and wild animals in nature have been decimated down to 4%. We have turned Carl Sagan's beautiful pale blue planet Earth into blood-stained planet slaughterhouse. Now, the great historian Barbara Tuckman defined folly as acting against our own best interests. That's folly. And Occam's razor, named after the 14th century Jesuit, said, when presented with a number of possible solutions to a problem, the simplest one is always the best. So let's apply these tests to the meat industry. Forest depletion by the meat industry costs three times as much as the global financial crisis. Zoonotic diseases from factory farms threaten a pandemic to rival the Black Death, which wiped out half of Europe. The World Bank says that one influenza pandemic alone would cost $3 trillion. And the Center for Disease Control in America lists 150 dangerous zoonotic diseases coming down the pike. And meat and dairy is killing us with cancers, heart disease, osteoporosis, and diabetes. Harvard University says that one third of early deaths could be prevented by everyone simply giving up meat. And Dr. Kasliwal warned in The Lancet that India has now accounted for 70% of the world's cardiovascular disease due to their addiction to milk. And more recently, the Sierra Club, not, knowing, <laughs> not known for being animal friendly in the slightest, begrudgingly admitted environmental violations by the meat industry add up to a rap sheet longer than war and peace. And Medicare and bad diets have bankrupted the, the once powerful United States. They would need $8 trillion invested in Treasury bills just to pay the interest, and they've got precisely zero. They could shut down every school, university, army, navy, air force, marines, homeland security, FBI, and CIA, and they still won't be able to pay for it. Well, how big is $8 trillion? That's how much the whole of Asia needs over the next 10 years for their electricity, roads, water, telecommunications, high-speed rail across China, ports in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, and the new Silk Road from Central Asia to Europe. That's the same number caused by the devastation of the meat and dairy industry in America alone. It is four times as big as India's GDP and double the total reserves of India and China combined. My debate on TV, on the ABC, to get animals off the menu, uh, menu went viral with many millions of viewers, and it, it was independently translated into over 20 languages. Oxford University then calculated that if everyone followed that result, it would save $30 trillion in health and environmental damage alone. And antibiotics, which we ultimately consume, 
is pumped into animals, causing antimicrobial resistance in humans, which will kill 10 million people per annum by 2050 and cost the global economy $100 trillion. If you thought $8 trillion was big, think about $100 trillion. This is 60 times what the whole world spends on aircraft carriers, missiles, bombs, bullets, drones, destroyers, tanks, planes, mines, guns, and spies. Meat and dairy. And water, as you know, is the new oil. Nations will soon be going to war over it. Underground aquifers that took millions of years to fill are now running dry. As a young boy scout, I drilled my first well and struck sweet water at 80 feet. Today I'm building an orphanage nearby and we're at 800 feet and we're sucking mud. In China, at 3,000 feet, the drill heads are still dry. Now you would be outraged if 10 jumbo jets crashed every day with no survivors. Well, the same number of children die every day from water-related diseases. The mighty Colorado River, the Rio Grande, the Indus, the Yellow Rivers frequently no, no longer reach the sea, sucked dry by the meat and dairy industry, while four billion people suffer from water scarcity. So why do I speak to you about water? Because it takes 50,000 liters of water to produce one kilo of beef. It takes 1,000 liters of water to produce one liter of milk, and a dairyman makes about 28 cents a liter. What a preposterously stupid industry. One billion people today are hungry. 20 million people will die this year from malnutrition. Cutting meat by only 10% will feed 100 million people, and going vegan ends malnutrition forever. And food prices are skyrocketing. It used to cost me for Thai rice for my projects in Asia, 197 US dollars a ton. And then it went up to 1,050. A five-fold increase in five months. And poor countries sell their grain to the West for hard currency whilst their own children starve in their arms. And the West feeds it to livestock. So we can eat a steak? I bet I'm not the only one in the room who sees this as a crime. Every morsel of meat we eat is slapping the tear-stained face of a hungry child. When I look into her eyes, do I remain silent? If everyone ate a Western diet, we would need two planet Earths to feed us. We've only got one, and she is dying. The Earth can produce enough food for everyone's need but not enough for everyone's greed. And greenhouse gas pollution from livestock now vastly exceeds that of transport. Cars, trains, buses, ships, the whole lot. And their methane is 24 times more potent than CO2. The melting Siberian permafrost is now a ticking time bomb. When it releases its sequestered gas, the game is over. If you want to be terrified, come with us and visit the Yamal Peninsula in Russia. The Himalayan ice fields are correctly called the third pole because they feed half the world's population through the Ganges, the Indus, the Brahmaputra, the Yangtze, the Irrawaddy, the Mekong, and the Yellow Rivers. And these glaciers are melting so fast. I presented these numbers in a speech to 2,000 wealthy Indian entrepreneurs in New Delhi including Amartya Sen, who had just won India's Nobel Prize in Economics. And I mentioned to Muhammad Yunus, just after he'd won the Nobel Peace Prize, that all the good that he had done would vanish when Bangladesh drowns. To say nothing about Manila, Mumbai, Calcutta, Ho Chi Minh City, and Bangkok. Kiribati has already bought 6,000 acres of land in Fiji to resettle its people. The Maldives is negotiating to buy land in Australia, and people are fleeing Tuvalu, the Marshall Islands, and Nauru. Five of the Solomon Islands have already vanished. You probably know we have 500 projects in over 40 countries, and the kinds of things we see so regularly 
<coughs> terrify us, but they don't seem to matter in the slightest to moral and intellectual and ethical lightweights like Barnaby Joyce and his ilk. And we had dinner with Al Gore and discussed the same numbers. And more recently, I delivered a speech in Melbourne with Dr. Peter Doherty, Australia's um, Nobel laureate in medicine. No arguments with my numbers at all from four great minds, four Nobel Prize winners, only from the disgusting, ignoble meat and dairy lobby. So Upton Sinclair was right. It is impossible to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. And we spoke to Admiral Denny McGinn, the chief of US warfighting requirements, and he said, we have learned that nations will raid and invade long before they starve. And here in Australia, we freak out when 1,000 refugees arrive on our shores. Just imagine greenhouse gas emissions hitting 500 parts per million or a three degree temperature rise, creating at a minimum 100 million eco-refugees. This calamity will reshape the geopolitical landscape forever. We are facing the perfect storm. If any nation had developed weapons that could wreak such havoc on the planet, we would launch a military strike and bomb it back into the Bronze Age. But we can't, because it is not a rogue state. It's an industry. The good news is we don't have to bomb it. We can just stop buying it. So George Bush was wrong. The axis of evil does not run through Iraq, Iran, or North Korea. It runs through our dining tables. Weapons of mass destruction are our knives and forks, and increasingly nowadays, our chopsticks. You see, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. This cruel, disgusting industry will end because we run out of excuses. Veganism is the Swiss army knife of the future. One instrument solves our ethical, economic, environmental, water, and health problems and ends cruelty forever. It rearranges the furniture of your mind. You think differently. And farmers actually are the ones with the most to gain. Farming won't end, it would boom. Only the product line would change. Farmers would make so much money they wouldn't even bother counting it. And I'd be the first to applaud them. Governments would love us. New industries would emerge and flourish. Health insurance premiums would plummet. Hospital waiting lists would disappear. Hell, we would be so healthy, we'd have to shoot someone just to start a cemetery. You probably know that the American AMA recently called for meat to be banned in every hospital in America. And the World Health Organization has now said they highly recommend a vegan diet for every thinking person on the planet. And six months ago, 40 investors who happened to control $2 trillion in assets called on all global food companies to replace animal protein with plant protein. I've just come back from the United States, and I discovered that plant, the plant-based food industry is growing so rapidly. I've often said that I really hope that the next billionaire will be someone who sets up a vegetarian or vegan version of McDonald's. My guess is he'll be Indian, probably from Gujarat. But if someone wants to become a billionaire and win the Nobel at the same time, that's the industry to do it in. Even at this early stage, the industry is booming. The plant-based food industry contributed $14 billion last year to the US economy, created more than 60,000 jobs, pays its workers 13,000 US dollars a year more than the average American salary, pays $1.1 billion in tax, produces 10 times fewer greenhouse gas emissions than beef, and gets no subsidies. And this kind of lifestyle also gives us the peace dividend. I addressed the World Parliament of Religions and I said, the peace map is drawn on a menu. P 
peace is not just the absence of war. It is the presence of justice. So talking about peace while still killing animals is like loving literature and still burning books. They are mutually exclusive ideas. Justice must be blind to race, color, religion, and to species. If she is not blind, she will be used as a weapon of terror, and there is unimaginable terror in those ghastly gulags we call factory farms where, as Lord Acton said, absolute power corrupts absolutely. You see, we need a new form of jurisprudence. Let justice be done, though heavens may fall. A new legal system, a foro conscientiae, a court of the conscience. So in my journey through Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, I've learned that a man is measured not by how much money he makes, but by how much of it he is willing to give away, particularly to strangers. And if you wish to increase a man's share of happiness, do not aim to increase his possessions. Simply decrease his desires. Socrates and Epicurus were right. The unexamined life is not worth living. It's not a life. It's a life sentence. I know I did not find my character on Wall Street because it lives on the road to Damascus. And my heart resonates to the poet W.H. Auden. If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. Martin Luther King said, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it polite? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? Is it right? Is the cruelty and slaughter of these innocent beings right? Now, I speak to audiences in many countries all around the world, and they're all good, caring, decent people who genuinely want to change the world as long as they don't have to change themselves. But life does not work that way. First, we change in our hearts, and then the world follows. True leaders must face their own demons courageously. Martin Niemöller, the German priest, philosopher, and U-boat captain, spent eight years in prison for condemning German intellectuals for being cowards. And he wrote, when the Nazis came for the communists, I remained silent. I was not a communist. When they locked up the Democrats, I remained silent. I was not a Democrat. When they came for the trade unionists, I did not speak out. I was not a trade unionist. When they came for the Jews, I remained silent. I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out. Men and women of integrity must speak out and act courageously. Is it not better to light a candle than to curse the darkness? All the darkness in the world cannot put out the light of a single candle. You see, I believe another day is dawning. And if I close my eyes, I can feel her heartbeat. It won't be easy, but do not be afraid. Remember Gandhi's words. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. The last sentence of Scott Fitzgerald's book, The Great Gatsby, reads, so we beat on boats against the tide, drawn back ceaselessly into the past. I ask you, are we to live forever in a sick, smug, and cruel past? Let's not relive history. Let's make history. 
because that is what leaders do. They make history. Judge White's closing words in the bonfire of the vanities were, the law is humanity's attempt at decency. So I plead with you to join us in the battle in a war that decency cannot afford to lose. Because in the end, only three things matter. How deeply you loved, how gently you lived, and how gracefully you let go of things that were not meant for you. Meat was not meant for you. Our animal cousins have survived millions of years of evolution. They've earned the right to share this planet with us in peace, and they have waited long enough. The brutes and the bullies have been Goliath. But David is coming. Maybe he's in this room. Maybe he is one of you. And if not you, who? And if not now, when? Thank you all for being here.